For this former fighter pilot, the sky isn't the limit. To start the STS-126 mission, booster ignition and liftoff of shuttle Discovery. Given the chance to go up into space and see a world without borders, without divisions, astronaut Ron Garin, who fought in war, turned against all wars. Good morning and welcome aboard the International Space Station. The candy bar and then... What he experienced changed his life forever. I ask Ron Garin what it means to have an orbital perspective. This is the inner view. He is a retired NASA astronaut and a former F-16 fighter pilot. Ron Garin joins us now on the interview. Sir, it's a pleasure having you on the program. You went up to space and something changed inside of you profoundly. There was a feeling, a thought, and a desire to do things differently afterwards. Tell us what happened and how you processed all of it. Well, hi, Imran. Thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think seeing our planet from the vantage point of space is a absolutely transformational experience. Um, and you know, it, it, you know, I went to space. I didn't see a choir or hear a choir of angels, and you know, see light come down from heaven or anything like that. It wasn't. It wasn't a, a flash of an epiphany, but I think it was an epiphany in slow motion. And what we see from that vantage point, I think, is the truth. And the truth is that we are one integrated, uh, interdependent biosphere teeming with life, that we're all whatever affects one of us affects all of us. That what you see from that vantage point is the true unity um, that exists. And we as a species are called to embrace that unity, to understand that unity. But we've uh, unfortunately been sleeping on the job a little bit. Mm. I remember Carl Sagan said that, it has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building exercise. And I mean, you, you tell me you went up to space and you, you discovered the truth or you realized the truth, right? It wasn't as if you went to the, to the supermarket and you were shopping in the vegetable aisle and something hit you, right? It, re it makes me think somewhat of the comparison to having a child. People will tell you, this will transform you, it will humble you, it will make you proud, it will make you reassess everything in life and make you realize your priorities. But of course, it's only once you actually have a child that you know what that truly means. So for you, was it, right. was it similar in the way that you expected something, you expected to be blown away, but it was fundamentally and utterly just beyond what you could ever imagine? I, I think it was fundamentally beyond what I could imagine. Um, Eventually, it did. It, like I said, it wasn't. It didn't happen in a flash. And I think you bring up a good point about you know people who have children. Is what is happening there? Well, the reason why that experience is so transformative is because it's awe-inspiring. And I think whenever we're immersed in awe and wonder, uh, the mind opens up and is more receptive to seeing what's right in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> to seeing the miraculous beauty that's right in front of us. And I think uh, being in space, floating by a window, looking at our at our beautiful planet um, is an awe-inspiring experience, one that opens up the mind. And what I was really struck with was a sobering contradiction, a contradiction between the indescribable beauty of our planet on one hand and the unfortunate realities of life on our planet. You know, we all know that life is not always as beautiful uh, as it as the planet looks from space, life on the planet. And so it fills you with a sense of injustice. It fills you with a refusal to accept the status quo on a planet. Or, uh, you know, we, you realize right away that it doesn't have to be this way, that we can live more harmoniously, more peacefully. Uh, we could take care of our planet better. And all these things just seem ridiculous. The way we treat our planet, the way we treat our, each other, all these things that we fight over, we quarrel over, that we think are so important, blur into insignificance when we see the planet from that vantage point, And we look absolutely ridiculous from the vantage point of space. There are those people who take that inspiration and that sense of wonder and awe and our technical capability of being able to explore the cosmos and say that, let's phone it in. Just as you said, the earth is a write-off. We've messed up, there's tremendous inequality, there's war, there's all this horrible stuff going on. 
we shouldn't be looking down, we should be looking up, we should get the hell out of here and we should go and colonize space and, and start afresh. I, I guess you disagree with that. Well, I, I do think that we should extend human presence out into the solar system and beyond. But when we do that, and we need to do that, we need to be not passengers escaping a sinking ship, but we should be ambassadors of a thriving planet. Because whatever issues, whatever problems, whatever challenges we have when we launch on that mission, uh, we're going to take with us. Um, the governance that, that we have, the environmental uh, outlook that we have, all of that stuff we're just going to take with us. So we need to solve the problems we have here on the planet while we're increasing our capability to explore the, the rest of the solar system and beyond. I think they're um, not only not mutually exclusive, they're required and complementary for us to do both at the same time. When, when you went up in 2011, you went on a Russian Soyuz craft. Um, there's a certain amount of cooperation that needs to happen between big powers, the United States, the Russians, and others. That's seemingly hanging by a thread right now, uh, that level right. of cooperation with the ISS. I know that the Russians have said they're sending a rescue mission to get two cosmonauts and one American astronaut back after uh, they were hit by some debris. So that's, that's a good sign. But then we have the war in Ukraine and we have the Russians threatening to move out of the ISS. So do you fear that that level of cooperation that's needed coming together, forgetting, dissolving all the differences, all the geopolitics, that might not be possible in the not too distant future, given everything that's going on in the world. Well, it's certainly possible, but it's, but it's very, very challenging because of all that has happened uh, in geopolitics in the world right now, particularly um, the war in Ukraine. And, you know, I, I spent the first 15 years of my adult life training to fight the Russians. I was a Cold War fighter pilot. Um, my first assignment was stationed on the tip of the sword in, in the former West Germany. Um, you know, we were expecting the Soviet Union at the time to come across the border. Um, and so, you know, if you fast forward uh, about 15 years um, or a little, a little bit more, I found myself at the base of a rocket that was going to take me to space on a cold April evening from a previously top secret Soviet military installation. And I had two Russian military officers as my crewmates. And I look up at the rocket and I saw an American flag and a Russian flag side by side. And I think what that illustrates um, is that when we immerse in awe and wonder, when we build partnerships, when we try and problem solve from a foundation of awe and wonder, miraculous things happen. It's when we try and build solutions on a, on a foundation of fear, which is the predominantly the, it's predominantly the way we, we problem solve on this planet is from a fear-based mentality. When we do that, uh, you know, we, we can accomplish a lot in the short term, but, but the only way to have long lasting solutions, the only way to have true collaboration, the only way to inspire folks to, to self-sacrifice for a greater cause is by building our partnerships, building our programs, building our problem solving process on a foundation of awe and wonder. And I think that's what you saw. So to answer your question, um, the, the space station partnership, the International Space Station Partnership, was built on a foundation of awe and wonder. That is why it has survived to this point. But it can only survive so long when everything around it is fear-based. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very um, worried about the future of, of that partnership. Uh, you know, we, we have plans to go to the moon, this time to stay, to set up a, a permanent human presence on the moon. I believe that should be uh, a full international effort together uh, as one uh, planetary species uh, called humans do, doing that together. Uh, but all these things, like I said, we look ridiculous from, from the vantage point of space. These right. things that we're fighting over, these things that we think are so important, are hindering that uh, ability to, to, to progress and, and, and lead towards the future that we'd all want to be a part of. War is fear-based. All our petty hatreds, our tribal hatreds, our political hatreds, religious hatreds, all of these things perhaps pale into insignificance when you're up there looking at the Earth from that distant vantage point. Was there an element of reevaluating your own time in war while you were up there? You, you served in the Iraq war, in the, in the first, first Gulf war, you were a fighter pilot. War involves killing. Tell me how you processed all of that given your new perspective from up high. Yeah, I think that war is humanity's biggest failure. Uh, and 
Uh, unfortunately, we live in a world where sometimes that happens. I, I wish that the international community would come together and outlaw war to say that we as a, as a uh, planetary community, not, I'm not going to use the word global, a planetary, because we don't live on a globe, we live on a planet, but our, we come together as a planetary community and, and say that we, as this community, um, will not allow war anymore, that that is not an acceptable way for nations uh, to resolve their, their conflicts. And so if somebody invades another company, uh, country, then um, the, the entire world would be against that, uh, would be uh, in opposition to, to that action. Uh, we don't live in that world right now. And in the case of the, the first Gulf War, where Iraq invaded Kuwait, um, you had a sovereign, one sovereign nation invading another sovereign nation. Uh, and after, the, after seven months of intense diplomatic negotiations to try and rectify that situation. Unfortunately, um, it came to war. Um, and so, again, you know, war is, is kind of the ultimate example of tribalism. Uh, and tribalism uh, has a lot of negative connotations to it. There's a lot of negative implications for, for tribalism, but there's also a lot of positive implications for it. it you know, the, the ability to self-sacrifice, even to self-sacrifice your life for a, a greater cause. I think, you know, war brings out the best and the worst in, in people. And if we can consider ourselves a tribe of earthlings, <laughs> I think that would be a, a really powerful way for us to move forward into the future that we yeah. don't want to be a part of. Yeah, I remember uh, reading some of Sebastian Younger's work and then speaking to him a few years ago, and he spoke about the fact that a lot of veterans, number one, they have to deal with the PTSD of, of war and all the horrible things that happened around them, the killing that they had to do. And on the other hand, one of the difficulties in readjusting to society or normal life was the fact that they missed the camaraderie, the brotherhood, the fact that they were fighting for their battalion or their squadron. They, they were brothers in arms, right? And I always wondered, right. like, well, how can we, why do we need an external enemy that we're fighting for us to feel the sense of brotherhood among our own? And how do you take that camaraderie and brotherhood and extend it beyond your own without needing a war for it. Right. Well, I, I don't know why we need an external enemy, but we have but we have tons of external <laughs> enemies. We have global warming, we have mm. poverty, we have we we have crime, we have all of these uh, you know, problems and challenges that are facing us that um, require a collaborative effort in order for us to solve. We're not gonna solve any of these things until we realize that we need to come together as a planetary species, as a planetary community and solve them together. Because no one nation, one, one, no one uh, NGO or corporation is gonna be able to solve these problems together. It, it has to be a collaborative effort. How do we move beyond that becoming wishy-washy sounding and platitude -y and into tangible, practical change on the ground? Where do you even begin? Well, I mean, to your point, a lot of the things that you hear sound like cliches, and they are cliches, um, like we're all in this together, and, and you know, we're all riding through the universe together on this spaceship that we call Earth. Um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the basic fact of the interrelated structure of all reality. Um, and even though these are cliches, just because they're cliches, it doesn't mean they're not true. Mm. <laughs> and, and we really are all in this together. And what does affect one of us affects all of us. Uh, and until we realize that there's no them, there's only us, we're not going to be able to solve our problems. That's the key step. Until we can make that step and realize it doesn't matter uh, what nation you're from, what religion you are, what ethnicity you are, we're all one human family. We're all in this together. There is no them. There's only us until we realize that and act on that and, and really integrate that into all of our daily actions, um, we're not gonna be able to solve the problems that we face. We'll just be slapping Band-Aids and, and temporary solutions uh, on all these problems, which we've been doing for, for centuries. Were you pleasantly surprised at the response to your videos, your books, and everything you've said since you came back from space and since you tried to share and process some of these experiences as you tried to articulate it as you went along over the past few years? Yeah, I, I, am, I am very happy that, that it's resonating with a lot of people because I, I believe that truth resonates. And when people hear the truth, uh, even if they can't fully understand what, what the person or the writer or the filmmaker is saying, 
it resonates on a deep uh, interpersonal level. And I think uh, that's what we're seeing um, because there's so much noise right now. There's so much, you know, falsehoods. There's so much deception in, in the world right now. And I think we are, um, you know, evolution has given us the ability to resonate with truth. Yeah. And I think that's what we're seeing is when, when right. you have undeniable, uh, you know, incontrovertible truth that, that you're presented with, it resonates. Yeah. And the internet is a meteor shower of, I, I can't swear on this program, I, I guess feces, right? I mean, there's just a lot of, <laughs> there's just, there's, there are terrible things on the internet. Yet, something like the latest Big Think video, which featured your work, your words, that bubbles up. The algorithm sometimes allows some good things to bubble up. Do you see it as a a greater responsibility to add a, a, a voice of reason, a voice of harmoniousness, of compassion and truth, trying to bring people together, particularly in light of the fact that people on social media, online, are constantly at each, other, uh, at each other's throats? Yeah, I, I think some of what we see on the internet is intentional. It's mm -hmm. intentional uh, uh, being uh, propagated by folks who are trying to make money, right? And so, but a lot of it's just the nature of how the internet was de designed. Uh, and the algorithms are designed to give us what we it thinks we want. And so uh, what that ends up doing is put us in, into echo chambered boxes where we're just hearing things that, that the algorithm thinks we want to hear. And so, you know, all of us have experienced this. We see people that we're close with, you know, family members, uh, close friends that, share opinions on the internet that we can't just we can't believe or can't understand or can't fathom how they could possibly think that way and we have to have a little bit of empathy in those cases because a lot of times the reason why they're doing that is they're not seeing the same stuff in their feed as we're seeing in our feed and the things that they're things that they're being bombarded with are not the same things that we're being bombarded with and so one of the first steps to be able to solve this problem is to not be part of the problem and so we can't really control what we're being fed, but we can control what we share, we can control what we're putting out into the world. And so it's really important on us to uh, really fact check, really um, you know, do some due diligence on anything we put on the internet. And, and if you read something on the internet and you feel yourself clenching up, you feel your, your blood pressure going up, you feel your heart rate going up, you feel yourself getting excited, you're being manipulated. <laughs> the algorithm is manipulating and you need to realize, instead of just hitting the share button, realize, okay, I'm being manipulated right now, let's see what's really behind all this. Don't believe everything you read on the internet, especially if it's attributed to me, said Abraham Lincoln or Mahatma Gandhi or, yeah, or, exactly. or someone like that. <laughs> exactly, um, yeah. I yeah. guess, do you have a, is your message a spiritual one? Do you feel comfortable with the fact that sharing your experience could delve into, the, into that aspect of, 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 of defining what it is? Yeah, I mean, spiritual, philosophical, um, there's more to the world than, than the materialistic view of the world. Um, there's more to the world than atoms and, and molecules. Um, and that, that's a proven scientific fact. I mean, quantum physics is, is taken us into, is blurring the lines between science and spirituality and, and, and even religion in some cases. And so it's a pretty arrogant view to think that we have it all figured out because we don't, you know, the, the universe is infinite. Uh, and so we're never going to have it all figured out, no matter how much we discover. Mm. We're never, there's always going to be more to discover. And so we have to approach all these things in a very humble mindset to, with, with the acknowledgement that we don't have all the answers. And that's that's part of the reason why we're in so much trouble on the Internet is because everybody thinks they have all the answers when they don't have the humility to admit that they, they, they don't have the answers. And that's how they um, achieve their self-identity is by – you know, coming up with ways to ground themselves, to, to ground themselves in an opinion, in a group, in a, in a group think. Um, and that's really, really counterproductive and very dangerous. You know, history shows us that that type of group think is very dangerous. Yeah, well, one of the ironies of space exploration, of all of our wonderful developments over the past, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years, uh, in getting to the moon, in sending missions to Mars, um, the International Space Station and the like, and just the technological advances. One of those ironies is the fact that all of this was born out of a, a Cold War between the United States and, and the Soviets, right? So 
you, you have this arms race. And right now, there's the suggestion that that has been tweaked to maybe the United States versus the Chinese. So tell me how you process that and, and how it sits with you, given that a lot of this gets its, its charge from militarism, from geopolitical competition. A lot of the funding comes from that because governments only want to spend money on this if there's some sort of strategic benefit that comes from it. How do you, how do you square that with using it for good? So uh, if I could take a minute or two and, and give you an analogy, because I think this is an important analogy. I think that a lot of what you talked about, the, the militarization, you know, beating the, the swords into plowshare mentality that led to the, the, the space program, I, I think that is kind of the, the first stage of a rocket. So imagine, imagine humanity is, is on, a, on a rocket, right? And um, this rocket is launching. And, you know, it takes incredible brute force to lift the rocket. And, the, and on the rocket is a super organism that represents all life on Earth, not only all life that presently exists, but all life that will ever exist. And as, as the rocket lifts off, um, you know, tremendous brute force. All of the, you know, dynasties and dictatorships align and, and fight and, and, you know, technological advancement in, in occurs because of, of this competition. Um, the First World War leads to, you know, radios and airplanes and, and the Second World War leads to nuclear power and solar power and the space race leads to, to you know, com computers and everything else. And all of this brute force gets us off the launch pad. But, Rockets launch in stages, right? And so you have the first stage and the second stage and the third stage. And how you get a rocket to orbit is by jettisoning the weight of the stage as it's no longer needed. Mm -hmm. And so even though all this stuff got us to this point where we have this incredibly technologically advanced civilization, it's time to jettison those old mindsets. It's time to jettison that this idea that we're completely independent, that we're independent entities operating in a solely self-serving vacuum, whether we're an entity that's a corporation or a country or, or a group of, of any side, that we have to realize that we need to jettison those old mindsets. We need to jettison you know, <laughs> those political processes that require secrecy to be, to be effective. We need to uh, jettison corruption. We need to jettison all these things that are holding us back. But as you know, we're reluctant to do that because we realize that all of those things got us to this point. But we don't realize that we can't make it to orbit carrying the, the all of that weight, all that baggage of what we need to leave behind. But when we do jettison all that and we fire the second engine, we'll be able to accelerate um, to orbit. And what is orbit? Orbit is where you no longer need your engines. Hmm. It's where, with no additional effort, you can maintain your altitude, or if you so desire, you could explore further out in, into the into the universe. Uh, orbit, our metaphorical orbit, is where we reach abundance. It's it's where it's where we solve the problems that are facing us. And so, we have to have the courage to be able to jettison all those things that no longer serve us, like war, like like corruption, like all like all of these things that that have uh, had tremendous have led to tremendous suffering, but also have been a catalyst to tremendous uh, advancement. We need to jettison that and embrace a new way of doing things, uh, fire that second stage, stage engine and, and get to orbit. We have some billionaires who are a, a unique and different variable compared to the past. Individuals, billionaires through their companies, uh, launching themselves physically up into space, launching their rockets up into space, the Elon Musks, the Jeff Bezos of the, of the world. When you look at that, do you think all power to them? They contribute to the to the common good here. They, they're helping us get up into orbit and then we can jettison them as well. Or are there some concerns when it comes to this as well? Well, there's certainly concerns, but, but I think overall, if done correctly, um, it's a good thing. I think these are the baby steps that will lead to a new era of space exploration where space travel will become as commonplace as air travel. You know, we don't think twice about getting on an airplane and flying anywhere in the world right now. And I think that we're at the dawn of a new era where um, we'll be able to do that with space travel as well. And not just, you know, flying to orbit or to the moon or other places in the solar system, but flying from point A to point B on the Earth where part of the flight path takes you outside of the atmosphere. Now, obviously, one of the big concerns is that we, if we have this exponential increase in space travel, we have to do it in an environmentally friendly way. We can't. 
we can't, you know, launch all these people into space with the hopes that they come back as environmentalists, but we're destroying the planet in the process. And so there are ways to do this uh, environmentally um, friendly t type of, of travel. And so as long as we're doing things right, I think this is a, a good a good first, you know, baby steps towards that new that new era. And what's next for Ron Garin? Well, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing, which is which is using every medium I, I can think of to share the perspective of our planet from space, because I think it's so powerful to our problem solving process. I think it's so powerful to how we treat each other, how we treat our planet. And so, you know, I'm continuing to write books. I'm continuing to do podcasts like this. I'm continuing to um, do consulting and public speaking and making movies and um, and art. I, I paint as well. And so every medium possible, because again, that when you do that, you're building a foundation of awe and wonder. And when when you address some of these really scary issues from a foundation of awe and wonder, even though they're scary, that doesn't mean that you have to be fearful of them, but that we can embrace them in a spirit of awe and wonder. And that opens up the mind. It opens up people to collaboration and cooperation. It, it inspires self-sacrifice. And it's the only way that we're going to be able to get out of this mess. Well, I absolutely loved the conversation. Ron Garin, thank you very Me much too. for joining us on the interview. All the best to you. Yeah, my pleasure, Imran. Thank you. Bye-bye.